Okay, so good morning everybody. So before everybody go into the analysis of the data, we will short a briefly review how the transcriptome of the cell can be captured. And um, we try to, to think a little bit about how experimental uh, protocol can alter the data and, um, and produce some batch effects, batch effects, for example. So I will start briefly by a, a short overview of the different technology and techniques that are available to capture a single cell transcriptome. I will also describe uh, um, the first step that through the generation of count matrix, basically uh, demultiplexing the cells and aligning reads. And I will give you briefly some example of downstream application like clustering and factor inference. And uh, in, the, in the last part, we will start to, to, to try to, to think about how uh, the, the, the processing of the sample can alter the data. So first of all, uh, the, uh, brief review of the technology and more importantly, all the libraries uh, of a single cell RNA seq can be generated. So this is a diagram that uh, um, summarizes the history of a single cell RNA seq. So this is a quite recent technology. It started uh, almost 10 years ago and the very first experiment were really about single cell because at that time, it was only one cell that was captured by end uh, under a microscope and put in a tube and processed individually. And when you read the paper, it was quite uh, laborious to, to produce the library. And since then, there have been uh, uh, lots of different improvements in the, the, the technological improvements in the processing of the data. Uh, we can um, especially uh, say that there were two major improvements, one in the field of molecular biology, uh, that was a SmartSec2 uh, developed uh, in uh, the Karolinska Institute uh, that allows the, the, the generation of a CDNA library from very minute amount of uh, RNA, like 15 nanograms. And maybe another very important uh, technical improvement was in the field of microfluidics that allows the encapsulation of thousands of cells in minutes uh, in very small reagent volume in, uh, in droplets. And, um, so um, at start, there are different ways to dissociate, isolate uh, your cells and put them either in micro wells or um, a small chamber or a droplet in so the, the library can be individually produced. And uh, uh, the, the way you separate your cells can have a dramatic uh, impact on the, the nature of the library. And uh, there are a couple of different uh, methods that are reported to both uh, isolate the cells and produce the libraries. And uh, we can basically uh, separate between two main uh, ways of producing the, the cDNA libraries. Uh, first strategy is to capture the mRNA with oligodity. And it's possible during the capture to add some specific uh, nucleotide uh, IDs, a cell barcode to, to help you to track the origin of the cell and a unique molecular identifier that helps you to track the starting uh, mRNA molecule. And another strategy is to, to, to sequence full length cDNA. And what you should keep in mind is uh, the, the sequencing machine are limited in, in the size of the cDNA that uh, is able to once, and the cDNA, the full cDNA molecule should be uh, fragmented, and some uh, adapter uh, should be ligated at each uh, end of the cDNA molecule in sorts that the fragments are captured in the flow cell for the sequencing. Right. So uh, when you generate a full length uh, cDNA library, you have you have a process that is called tagmentation that both fragments the cDNA and adds some uh, adapter ligators right, to, to, to ensure the sequencing. And the problem is this step is make incompatible the introduction of UMI, because when you randomly uh, uh, share your CDNA, full length CDNA molecule, you, you, you lose the tag uh, that is uh, produced on the three prime end. And uh, uh, it's important to add uh, some UMI in three prime library. There, there is a great interest in hiding a UMI unique molecular identifier. Uh, you start from a, a defined number of molecules, um, of mRNA molecule, and uh, during the library preparation, you have amplification uh, of the cDNA because uh, reverse transcription can amplify the, the, the cDNA, and uh, you have some step of qPCR as well that can duplicate the, the molecule. So uh, the, the starting number of molecules is um, 
is uh, is low. So when you had some UMI unique molecular identifier, you can measure the level of duplication of each uh, uh, molecule and uh, start, uh, find back the original uh, amount of molecule. And when you are using a full lens CDNA library, so you lose the UMI, so you have alternative solution to try to quantify the bias of amplification, and as I will give you more details about that, you can hide some, hide some spike ins to, to evaluate the level of duplication. So what you should keep in mind also is uh, on three prime BAs UMI-based technology, uh, you have a, a duplication of the uh, transcripts that uh, allow to have a better coverage of the part of the mRNA that is sequenced. Um, um, okay, I will go fast. So basically, uh, we can present the thing in a very dichotomous way. You have mainly two uh, main uh, technologies that are used to, uh, nowadays. Uh, either you use SmartSeq2, uh, so you sequence a very low number of cells with a quite uh, sequencing depth, or you uh, uh, capture lots of cells, thousands of cells, and have a lower depth. So um, just to have an idea, among you, uh, who does neither use SmartSeq2 or uh, 10x? Uh, or oh, uh, you? What kind of technology? Uh, ah, you are using. So, who is neither using SmartSeq2 nor droplet-based technology? You okay? What kind of? Uh... No, no. Okay. So okay. Okay. So basically, everyone is using either SmartSeq2 or 10x, right? Yeah. Okay. Henry, how many are? Only one? Okay, so like 99% of the people are here to analyze 10 x data sets, basically. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, okay, so basically, either you capture high number of cells or low number of cells with a, 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 a much um, sequencing depth. But uh, 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 the more cell is not necessarily better. The main advantage of 10x genomic is that you can capture a huge number of cells. But here's this uh, study that shows that from embryonic, um, different type of embryonic cells that are captured with 10x, uh, if you subsample uh, the cells that are captured, actually, you still can uh, distinguish the different subset of the cells. Uh, if you have a minimum of cell, like 100 of cells, it can be enough to, to define uh, your smaller subset. So the, 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 the fact that you encapsulate more cells is not necessarily uh, a key point in your experiment. For example, if you are studying a quite homogeneous population, if you have two cell types, 50-50, so you don't need to have uh, 10,000 cells encapsulated. 100 or 200 of cells are enough. So if you have to distinguish between high number of detected genes or high number of cells, that's a point that you should consider when you, you plan your experiment. And so in terms of uh, the libraries that are produced, there is strong bias depending on the technology you are using. So in three prime bias, uh, UMI-based, uh, droplet-based uh, technology, you have a clear coverage uh, on the three prime side. And with SmartSec2, you have a, a full length coverage, right? So it has strong implication in terms of application. For example, if you are looking for specific transcript isoforms, likely you will mostly focus on this kind of application. Because if you are looking for a transcript with a spike event on the five prime side, you will lose this information, right? But still, it's possible to look for some splice um, form. Even in generally in single cell uh, RNA seq, you are mostly looking for gene expression, not transcript expression, right? But as an example, uh, talking about splice form, uh, let's consider, for example, a TCR chains, right? A TCR are rearranged to, to, to ensure a huge diversity in detection of the, uh, the different chain. And basically, you have a recombination between three segments, V, D, and G, and which is linked to a terminal segment, which is very long. The, a C domain. So basically, you have a transcript with a huge variability in the five prime uh, side, right? And if you are trying to look for the uh, rare range chain in three prime uh, BAs uh, uh, chemistry, actually, it's only possible to, to find a variation in the TCR sequence in about one or two percent of the cells. But there are some uh, molecular biology tricks that allow you to switch the BS uh, from uh, three prime to five prime. 
uh, because during the um, generation of cDNA, you can have some free uh, cytosine and you are able to, to link uh, a sequence comprising a UMI and a serial marker, right? So you invert the BS. And in this case, you are able to detect up to 100% uh, of the of the rearrange uh, TCR sequencing. So th this is uh, something that you can plan if you are looking some for some different splice form. It's possible to to, to consider this kind of uh, approaches with a single cell experiment, right? So in terms of sensitivity of coverage across the different technology, basically when you compare SmartSeq versus any other um, type of technology, you have a, a stronger uh, sensitivity. You detect much more genes. And there is an interesting uh, uh, war that has been done uh, quite recently, actually. Uh, people uh, did, took some uh, embryonic stem cells, mouse embryonic stem cells, the same kind of cells, and they sequence the cells across different technology, targeting one million of read, whatever the technology, right? And what they observe is that more or less you uh, achieve a saturation point at about one million um, of read per cells. But when you look for the technology like SmartSer2, you detect much, much uh, higher number of genes. So what is, uh, how do you, uh, you can define the saturation curve actually? Uh, when you sequence for one million of reads, you can then subsample uh, your uh, your sequencing experiment, and then try to reconstruct uh, this saturation curve and try to find uh, when uh, you reach a plateau, right? Because the more you sequence, the more gene you will detect. But what you should keep in mind is uh, the saturation point is almost never achieved in single cell experiments. There are lots of genes that are expressed that you can't detect, either because of the limitation of the technology. For example, in replicated technology, you capture, you have a capture rate of the transcript that can vary, right? And you have more or less efficient amplification of the cDNA. And uh, so uh, the fact is that you have a lot of dropout. Uh, what we define as dropout is some uh, missing signal in your, uh, in your data set, meaning that the gene is expressed, you have the mRNA, but the technology is not able to, 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 to find, to detect the transcript. And uh, you have a varying level of uh, dropout, but we know that generally in 10x experiments, three quarters of the gene are not detected. And even in SmartSec2, you have a much higher level of sensitivity, but still you can't detect all the genes that are really expressed. And uh, a practical consideration when you apply in your experiment, for sure, is, is the cost. Generally, SmartSec2 is uh, much, uh, much more expensive. So, all right. So, uh, it was a, a brief review of the different technology um, that allow to capture a single cell transcriptome. So, you build a library, you have a, your CDNA library. So, you start to sequence the library and you have some FASTQ files and the different step that allow you to produce a count matrix because that will be the starting point of all the analysis. You are here mostly to work on downstream analysis starting from the count matrix, but I will briefly present you how you switch from FASTQ files from, uh, to, to, to the count matrix. So first of all, the first step that you, the first thing that you should keep in mind is that a single cell rna -seq is rna -seq, right? And you can have some sequencing issue, it happens. So it's very important, whatever the technology you are using, uh, it could be 10X uh, or SmartSec2, you should check the quality of your uh, sequencing data and you, you can check uh, uh, the, the, the quality of the FASTQ. There are popular tools that, to, that help you to visualize and to check the integrity of the FASTQ, FASTQ files. So here, for example, you have an example uh, where you had a technical issue during the sequencing. Uh, you have a, an issue in the lane of the flow cell, and it can dramatically uh, decrease the sensitivity of the, of, the, of the experiment. So you can bioinformatically exclude, remove, trim all the reads that are of low quality. What you should keep in mind is that in the default process from cell ranger pipeline, you don't have any quality trimming at all, actually. You can check the level of uh, quality based on Q30 uh, score, but there is no quality trimming by default. A second step, especially uh, in a droplet, uh, droplet based technology, is the, the cell calling. So the strategy in droplet based technology is uh, to avoid to encapsulate two cells at a time. You have a huge number of empty drops, 
and only a few number of cells that are incorporated, right? So basically, in your experiment, you have a huge amount of empty drops, of empty drops and only uh, a couple of cells. So you first have to identify what droplets contain really cells. So this is a phase of, uh, of cell calling. So uh, this diagram will be probably very uh, familiar to all of you that are working with standing data sets. And all the three drawgram actually represent exactly the same thing. So basically, you can count the number of UMI detected according to the different cellular barcode, right? And you sort the putative droplet containing potentially a cells according to the number of UMI contained in the droplets, right? And so this is a cumulative count. And at a certain point, uh, you first incorporate uh, two cells with high content, high UMI content, and then you have empty drops. So you reach a knee point and then you have a, a, a plateau, right? And this diagram is exactly the same information, but um, in terms of density, and I think it is much more um, easy to, to, to understand. It's much more similar than a flow centimetric plot, for example. So here you have a peak of cell with high mRNA content, high UMI content, right? And on the left, you have a peak with empty drops, right? With very low UMI content. But here, this is uh, an easy, perfect experiment. We had a sample with uh, uh, only one type of cells. The, it was uh, purified T cells uh, that are quite uniform in terms of uh, transcript content, right? But if you have a very heterogeneous sample, you can have many different pikes and you can have many different inflection points here, right? So the strategy is not necessary to, 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 to pick up the, the peak with a higher content, but mostly to exclude the peak with the lower content that are probably uh, empty drops, right? So this is a step of, uh, of cell calling. So after the cell calling, you have to, to quantify your transcript. So you have some reads, you want to, to associate them to, 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 to gene expression. So basically there are in the field two main approaches. Uh, one approach that involves uh, uh, mapping and one approach that uh, perform a transcript quantification in a, a mapping free uh, approach. So by using cell ranger, the default approach is to perform alignment uh, and star is an engine that is used, that is used uh, with Selanger. But there are other approaches so, such as uh, uh, Salmon, Calliston Express that uh, use different uh, technology. So first, the, the, the mapping step uh, using STAR. Uh, so you, you start from a FASQ file, you align your FASQ file uh, to a reference genome, right? And uh, then you quantify, you transcript based on the, the alignment. But uh, you can also use a di different approach. Uh, Calisto Salmon and this kind of tool uh, basically perform uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, pseudonym. Yeah, pseudonym. Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking about the the, the, the camera. Basically, you index, you slice, you read in different camera, right? And uh, your reference index uh, contain not the, the information about the sequences, but the different uh, amount of camera you can have as a unique camera or camera that are shared across the uh, transcript. And then uh, uh, this approach is much, much more powerful than basic alignment. And basically, what is tracking is that you can in minutes with a very low amount of memory that is consumed, uh, quantify your transcript with this approach. And uh, this tool also offers to bootstrap uh, the quantification and uh, uh, producing some estimate of the, the transcript variation. Okay, so I, I skip this step. So whatever. So. Um, so the first step uh, I produce uh, in the GitHub, you can see uh, a lab, uh, optional lab. Uh, if you want to start from the FASQ file by yourself and align uh, your FASQ file and produce by yourself the count matrix, you have an optional lab on the GitHub that will rely on the Salmon tool. And uh, the, 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 the important point is that you don't have to use any high performance computing to, to, to do this quantification. You can do uh, it on any laptop. So if you want to try it uh, as a homework, uh, you are uh, 
you are invited to do so, right. So, um, so the time is flying, so I, I will go fast on the downstream application. So basically, you, you perform the transcript quantification, so what you will produce is a count matrix, right? So you have uh, a big table of cells versus genes. And what you should keep in mind is because of the high level dropout, you have lots of missing information. So a, a way to, to efficiently store uh, this kind of information with R is uh, using a specific object that is called a, a sparse matrix. So basically, you index uh, a list of adjacencies rather than a table filled with zero, right? And so uh, among different applications, the first uh, thing that you can do is to, to, to reduce the dimensionality and cluster the cells. But here, this is an example I produced uh, with a specific function, uh, a matrix that is that contains only random data, right? This is not real data. And even with data from a random function, you can perform a dimensional reduction, you can perform clustering. And for example, here you can see some cells that look like green cells and some red cells, and you can perform even from random data differential expression tests and spot some uh, false uh, differentially expressed genes. So what you should keep in mind is uh, 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 you can uh, partition any kind of data, any kind of matrix, even random matrix. So you, you should uh, be very careful about the interpretation you can do from uh, this kind of approaches. And uh, what you should keep in mind, is how do you define a cell subset? Is a cell cluster really related to a biological cell subset? What you should keep in mind is you can have some uh, plasticity or dynamics, a different uh, a state of cells, right? And you can have some dynamics. So uh, uh, a cell subset is not necessarily directly related to, to, to uh, functionally uh, cell subsets. So um, a discrete representation of the data is not necessarily the best way to describe uh, this kind of uh, differentiation process. So you have some uh, alternative uh, way to represent the data. A very popular one is to, to classify the cell according to a continuous scale, a pseudo time scale, when you have a differentiation processes. So uh, trajectory inference is uh, one popular way to, to represent this kind of data. And when you reorder a sequence of transcriptional events, you can also find some correlating genes, genes with expression correlate together to try to identify some modules of genes to understand how uh, the different cellular states are uh, produced, right? Uh, I will keep uh, this one and this one to, to, to save some time. So I wanted to, to discuss a little bit about um, the, the source of variation produced by the processing of the data, right? So in the end, you have a count matrix, but the, the content of your count matrix is, um, is composed of different factors. So you have different BS, you have uh, amplification BS, decision BS, uh, capture BS, etc. But um, Depending on the time you produce the data, the way you produce the data, generally you have some protocol to dissociate some tissue to produce a single cell if you're not working, for example, from cell uh, with cell from blood. Uh, if you are working from solid tissue, you have to dissociate them. And from batch to another one, you can have a various level of stress applied to the cell. And it can dramatically impact the, the data. And generally, what is done is you almost are in a confounding, fact, in a confounding situation. Uh, it's really complicated to uh, mix different sample, different replicate in a single time, in single experiment, in single cell experiment. So there is some technical uh, solution to try to pull, to merge different replicates in a single experiment. You can use a, a, a technique derived from the site seek. So the, the principle of the site seek is to use antibody that will recognize uh, uh, epitopes, right? And these antibodies are uh, linked to a uh, um, uh, nucleotidic sequence uh, linked to a, a poly A tail. So you can uh, um, uh, identify specific nucleotides, uh, mix the information of the transcriptome with the proteome, right? And an approach to multiplex different samples in a single sequencing experiment, single, uh, single cell experiment, uh, is to use uh, an antibody recognizing uh, the same epitope and using different barcodes. For example, if you are working on immune cells, you can use an anti-CD45, right? 
And if you have five different experimental batches, you can use five different barcodes using the same antibody and mix all the experiment. And this way you are able to, to sequence, to process the cells in a single experiment. So this is an approach that is called uh, cell hashing. And uh, I, I will skip the, 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 the doublet as a contamination of uh, different subset. As I will, will give you more information about the, the just after. Uh, but what you should keep in mind also is that um, if you look for the most mostly expressed gene in a single cell experiment, what you will see, whatever the, the kind of cell, the type of cell, whatever the organism is uh, in the top list of a gene, you will have lots of ribosomal protein, right? And basically you can have between 30 to 15% of the genes that are ribosomal protein. And uh, what you should know is the, 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 the regulation of uh, ribosomal protein can be uh, very fast, very responsive, depending on the environment of the cell, right? What we know is when the cells are in a good environment with a lot of nutrients, with a um, correct amount of oxygen, you have uh, induction of a ribosomal protein. But when the cells are in a very restrictive condition, like hypoxia with a defect of nutrient or so on, you have a lower expression of ribosomal protein. So if you have half of the genes that are detected that are ribosomal protein, and if those genes are quickly regulated, so it can dramatically impact the level of all other genes, and it's sufficient to produce a huge batch effect. So uh, let's see together a, a case study. So this is the experiment where some immune cells have been isolated from a solid tumor, right? So the processing is quite uh, stressful for the cell. It's require enzymatic digestion, right? So you have non-tumor tissue and tumor tissue. And in tumor tissue, the, the tumor, the, 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 the tissue is much more dense and the condition of the cell isolation are more uh, strict. So it induces higher level of cellular death that can be measured by uh, the friction of mitochondrial genes. And the experiment decided to switch between two types of experiments. The first experiment was a, a sorting by flow cytometry, but he, he figured out that uh, the experiment was very long. The sorting time was two, three hours. So then he decided to switch to another uh, protocol. He tried to pre-enrich using um, magnetic columns, uh, the cell uh, preparation in, in sort uh, to, to, to reduce the, the sorting time. So here, this is after pre-enrichment of magnetic uh, column, right? And what, what you can see, the, the sorting time was much closer. The cells were much more happy and had a resulting uh, result. You have a fraction of ribosomal genes that are much more higher in the second uh, condition than in the first, right? And as I said, uh, ribosomal protein is highly expressed in the cell. And in this condition, you detect much less genes as compared to the first uh, condition, right? So depending on the state of the cell, on the amount of uh, ribosomal protein, you can detect, you can be in much more limiting detecting situation and it can produce a huge batch, batch effect. And talking about batch, about batch effect, this is a, a, another case study. So here we are not talking about human cell, we are talking about uh, mouse technical replicates. So the, the, some cells have been isolated from the thymus so the situation is much more simple. And we're talking about litter mates, so perfect technical replicates, right? And when you uh, uh, analyze separately each replicate, you can more or less de distinguish the same cluster of cells, right? Here we have the color code indicating the different subset. Uh, no need to, to, to go too deep in the details. But when you merge both batches and perform a, a common uh, dimension reduction and clustering, actually you can see that both batches do, do not overlap. Rather, you have a, a mirror representation of uh, both batches. And if you go a little bit in the uh, quality control metrics to, to, to understand how the batch, batch effect is generated, actually uh, there are two, two observations you can do. So in, during the cell calling, you can see that you have the two cells right, and the empty drops, right. And here you have a, a small peak. Actually, the, the sort was much more faster and you have much more cellular debris here, right? They are not empty droplets, but rather cellular debris. And uh, 
a key point is that across the two different batches, you have a different level of ribosomal uh, protein. Like you switch from uh, 30% of ribosomal protein to 16, 15, 16%, twice the, the fraction of ribosomal genes. So as a consequence, you detect a, a lower number of genes and it's sufficient to, to, to generate a batch effect. The problem is that you can simply filter the filter and just remove the cell with high ribosomal gene in this context. So you have to apply some different strategy of batch correction. And here, this is a, a correction that has been done with uh, mutual nearer, nearer, uh, mutual nearest nearer. So uh, as a summary, uh, this table uh, summarizes uh, well the different um, artifacts that can be generated from the, the single cell experiment. So depending on the way you produce, you generate the cells, you can have uh, stringent or uh, astringent um, effects. And uh, the, the, the way you dissociate your tissue, the way you isolate the cells, and the time of the process are a key point that can induce a batch effect. So even if you just have access to the data, it's very important to talk to the biologist who generated the data if you didn't generate the data by yourself to try to understand uh, the different experimental conditions and uh, identify the potential sources of, uh, of artifacts, right? So uh, in summary, uh, there are inherent uh, technical limitations in single cell rna -Sec. First, you will have lots of dropout. You will not detect all the genes. If you do not see a gene, that doesn't mean it is not expressed. Uh, you can have sample contaminated by unexpected cell type. You can have doublet cells. Uh, and uh, an important point is that uh, replicate without technical batch effect is very, very unlikely. So I'm sure all of you are already some data set and you probably already uh, noticed uh, this point. And uh, so, yeah, during the process of the RENASEC, uh, it's important to understand the, the, the nature of the proportion of the sample to, to, to try to retro-engineer the potential batch effect and try to correct uh, them accordingly. And um, before applying any batch correction, that's important to individually process uh, the data separately to understand the limits uh, and the stress applied to, to, to each sample. So thank you for your attention.